Replayability is both a simple and complex subject in gaming. Its importance heavily depends on the game we are talking about. For story heavy games or games with minimal gameplay, replaying a game once or twice can still be fun, but they were not created with replay value in mind. Meanwhile, arcade type games or multiplayer heavy titles absolutely require this aspect to thrive. But then we have games stuck in the middle, mainly platformers and action games. These games are weird in this department. In one half, they have definitive beginnings and endings. They should be perfectly enjoyable on your first go, but the very best of these titles are the ones that go even beyond that, offering such intriguing gameplay where the act of learning and mastering the movement and level design can enhance that initial enjoyment. There's only one problem with that, a problem that grows bigger every day. Why? We are far from the era of arcades or the early generation of consoles. Games are now fighting against each other, not for your money, but for your time. As much as I don't like this mentality, most people decide which games to buy depending on how many hours they can squeeze out. They either want epic cinematic experiences that would change their lives, or a big online multiplayer game where they quickly can hop in and hop out for a couple rounds. That leaves single player, and for the sake of this video, platformers and action games in a tricky spot. For most people, a game like Kirby and the Forgotten Land or Metroid Dread is only a short 7 to 15 hour adventure at most. But if you ask a fan of those games how many hours they have, well, it all lies in that replay value. People that really like these type of games don't care about the short length of lack of content, because to them, the replay value aspect is so strong that it doesn't matter. For them, replaying a game over and over and getting better is part of the fun. But that's the minority of the player base. If only there was a way to indirectly push the player to experiment with the replay value without it feeling forced. That was cool! It really is that simple, huh? The ranking system. Sonic's special hidden ingredient. While other games have found other ways to push reliability, like Metroidvania with a flexible upgrade based progression, or Kirby and Mega Man's copy abilities, or maybe a simple speedrun timer, the ranking system is one of the most popular and most liked ways to accomplish this goal. You slap a letter at the end depending on how well you did, maybe a cool animation, and BAM! You just made your game 10 times better. But it's not as simple as that. There are a lot of factors that can ruin the system. And what better way to analyze the wonderful and terrible implementation of the ranking system than with Sonic? Before we can talk about the ranking system, we need to take a look at the past and to see how we got to this point. Sonic has always been a serious love for its insane replay value. Due to the first game not having a way to save your data, Sega made sure replaying Sonic 1 over and over again would only get better as you improve at the game, getting faster every run, collecting more points, switching between the multiple paths at a moment's notice. The game was designed with replay value in mind. Now, did they succeed? Well, Green Hill is pretty fun. While Sonic 2 kept with the same mentality as Sonic 1, CD and 3 gave it their own spin. CD had different endings depending on what you did, while the level design was more focused on exploration than speed. 3 and Knuckles had multiple characters to choose from, so now every time you went to replay the game, you had another way to experience the same zones. Or if you're playing as Knuckle, unlock some new paths and fight harder bosses. These were perfectly fine ways to incentivize replay value, but they lacked the... Why? If you never played this game before and decided to play them nowadays, you would just beat it once, maybe give it a second playthrough with Knuckles in Sonic 3, and move on. Which, in my opinion, means you lose a ton of value when playing the classic. So moving to the Dreamcast, Sonic Team decided to greatly expand the scope. One of the things they did to accomplish this goal was having the ranking system. Kinda. It's more of a mission system more than anything. Every stage has three different missions. Beat the stage, collect enough rings, beat it fast enough, with some differences here and there depending on the character. The problem is that the missions don't change anything about the level design and you can complete multiple missions at once, which means that you need to play the same level three times the same way to get all the emblems. The only missions that are remotely interesting are big the cats, since you need to explore the levels to look for bigger fish. It leads to you to discover places that you didn't even knew existed before, which is pretty cool, I didn't consider. Too bad they make Big's gameplay even worse. And then we finally have Sonic Adventure 2, which, this time for real, introduced the ranking system. It's pretty simple in concept. The better you do on the level, the better the rank. It's genius. So good in fact that from that point on, every 3D mainline game had ranks in some sort of way. Except Sonic Lost World, but shh. 
but not every ranking system is created the same way. From SA2 onwards, different games have different ways to determine your rank, with the two most popular aspects being time and points. So that's why I created the Rankinometer. To better show you how this meter works, let's look at the newest game in the series, Sonic Frontiers. Despite being a big change for the series, Cyberspace works as a way to still keep the same type of boost levels in the game, and as any other Sonic boost game, it includes ranks. From D to S, the major difference of these ranks compared to the rest is how they determine the rank. The only thing that matters here is how fast you get to the green portal, how fast you end the level. It doesn't take into account ring collected, enemies defeated, or even if you died. As long as you beat it fast enough, you will get an S, which is why this game goes in the far left of the rank kinometer. On the contrary, take a game like Sonic Frontiers. Again! Of the two introduce the action chain challenges. While they work very different to any other level in any Sonic game, they still use ranks, and to get that perfect S rank, you need to get as many points as possible in a set time limit. You get points by doing almost anything. Collecting items, defeating enemies, boosting, grinding, tricking, using springs, choosing boosters, and probably other stuff. The only thing that doesn't matter here is the time. You need to get enough points in the nine time, yeah, but it doesn't matter if you get the S rank the first 10 seconds or just clutch it out at the end. Both are still an S rank, which means it goes in the far right of the rankinometer. With these examples out of the way, it's very simple to start putting other games in it. The other boost games like Unleashed, Day Stages, Generations and Forces are closer to the left side. They do have other factors in determining your rank, mainly rings and if you died, but if you hold the boost button and don't mess up, you are good to go. Unleashed is by far the most relying on points than the others, but the big factor is still becomes time. Sunny Colors, on the other hand, goes very far to the right. This is something people, especially color haters, don't notice or care, but Colors is not like the other boost games. Similar to how Sonic CD compares to the other classics, Color has a much bigger emphasis on exploration. The difference between the two is the ranking system. With it, you are actually encouraged to explore, and in some levels it's absolutely required if you want to get that sweet S rank. Not to mention, Rare Rings, which are the main optional collectible for the game, also give you tons of points, which is a great way to force players to experiment with the game's mechanics, like the Wisps. And I mentioned the Red Rings in particular because no other boost game cares about their collectibles when getting a rank, which I feel is a big missed opportunity. Sonic Colors is such a great example of how good a ranking system can completely change a game's direction. While it doesn't fix issues like the short levels of the experimental gimmicks, it improves the experience on so many levels. But, as I said before, many people don't realize this aspect of the game. And that's because the timer barely gives any points, and most people's perception of Sonic is to go fast, so when the game doesn't reward you for being fast, people tend to care less. That's why in my opinion the best type of ranking system is the one that stands firmly in the middle of the rankinometer, and those games are the adventure style games. Ah, Secret Rings and Black Knight, but I have no clue how those games determine your ranks or which is not them, okay? They fundamentally work the same as something like Colors. Hit enemies, collect rings, around, find out. The main difference between Colors and these games is the big emphasis on the time bonus score. Color has it, yes, but not only do these games show the raw points in the time bonus you get, it's much more significant to the overall score by just how many points they give you. Now, you don't need to rush the goal as soon as possible or f*** around for 8 minutes collecting points, but do a combination of those things. There's no time to waste doing random bullshit. But you also can't just hold forward all the time, and when you master that balance to get a hard to get S rank, it's the best feeling a Sonic game can give you. So why did they keep f***ing it up? Sonic Adventure 2 has what the manual calls technique points, that are given to you by performing long homing attack chains or by performing cool stuff like grind rails and tricks. This is brilliant and so in for Sonic. He is a type of guy that doesn't only go fast, but makes it look stylish, look cool. The type of attitude that separates him from other fast characters and other video games in general. Not to mention that to get better technique points, you have to move fast when approaching ramps or grind rails. Having a big part of your ranking system be centered around moving fast and doing cool stuff in the way is perfect. So why did they remove it? Heroes kept the technique points to some extent with the enemy chains and added rainbow rings, but they removed any sort of trick system. But what's even worse, they removed the funny names! Shadow went a step further and removed the technique points in general, which makes sense. 
This game is very unique when it comes to how to determine your rank, since it divides points in dark points and hero points and normal points, depending on what enemies you defeat. They could have still added the technique points in some way here and there, but coupled with the mission structure shadow, I get it. Now, Sonic 06, that's just embarrassing. So the manual of the game clearly explains that aside from the usual rings and enemy kills, points are also given by performing a series of great moves or quickly defeating a group of enemies. This is a straight up lie. Sonic 06 was supposed to bring back the technique point system with funny names included, but just like many things in the game, it was either cut or badly implemented at the last second. You can still see some redness from this with stuff like the rainbow rings, but SA2 this is not. Just compare a stage like White Acropolis to Cityscape, both stages start off with Sonic in a snowboard. If both of these games only rely on time for the ranking, you could just hold forward and move on with the stage. But thanks to the technique system, this once boring auto scroll becomes yet another incredible challenge where you need to keep your speed and take sharp turns or then jump off ramps just at the correct time for goodies. The difference here is that in Adventure 2 this idea is successfully executed while in No 06... Yeah... Because of technique points not existing, the beginning part of White Acropolis, while having more hazards and tricky terrain, falls completely flat thanks to this one exclusion. To make matters worse, Sonic 06 is the only game in the city to have only one same point treasure for every stage. No matter if you are playing Wave Ocean or Crisis City, you will always only need 5000 points, which doesn't sound bad at first, but then you realize it makes getting an S rank easier in the harder levels, thanks to then having a lot more enemies and just being overall longer. Do I need to explain why this is bad? Hopefully I don't. It's a shame too, because just like in many, many other places, Project 06 shows just how incredible 06 could have been. Technique points are here to stay. Say bye bye to mashing the A button and say hello to enemy chains where you need to prolong your airtime with stuff like hitboxer or using the bounce bracelet. Instead of awkward jumps in the snowboard section, you have awesome tricks that give you a whole new layer of complexity to the stage. Simple changes like this bring such a refreshing take to 06's already great level design, making what once was actually the worst ranking system to one on par with Sonic Adventure 2. But despite how much I rambled about this rankingometer, there are actually some other factors that are just as or even more important than time versus points. One of them are upgrades. Take a look at a stage like Metal Harbor. You get introduced to the light speed dash, a mechanic that is pretty significant or even required to perform to get an A rank. The thing is, you don't get access to the light speed shoes until halfway through the level, making getting the best rank almost impossible in your first run. Something similar happens in Sonic Unleashed. The first level of the game is almost impossible to S rank without upgrading your speed. These instances are what I would call bad use of upgrades. You might say, well, they incentivize replaying the stage to get a better score, isn't that the whole point of the ranking system? And you are right, but making upgrades mandatory to get the best score is bad, because the player will either endlessly try to stage over and over until they give up, or will feel incentivized to replay the level until it's much further in the game, at which point 90% of the players won't even care. This is more a problem with Sonic Unleashed and Adventure 2 since that game gives you the upgrades during the level and it's not an optional skill that you can upgrade later. But still, on repeat playthroughs, Metal Harbor always makes me feel like I'm not able to express my experience and expertise with the game's mechanics. Strangely, Sonic Forces gets this perfectly. The battle stages are designed to be s rank with any type of weapon or all special bonus. The different weapons and perks you can get only makes replaying the stages easier or add a special twist with extra paths you couldn't take before. Which would be useful if the stages weren't baby easy to s rank. Games like 06 with its gems, Black Knight with its different night styles, and now Frontier with things like the Spin Dash, all of those makes replaying stages feel much more satisfying. While not mandatory to get a good score, it's fun pushing the game to the limit or to try something new once in a while. My favorite of this kind has to be Generations. There's so many stupid and fun things you can do with that game. Like have the elemental shields, perform tricks faster, use a skateboard whenever you want, slow down time, use a homing attack with classic Sonic, and more. Another very important aspect is the reward. What do you get for getting the best score or for getting it in every level? The simplest best example there is of this is Sonic Adventure 2 with Green Hill Zone. At the time, it was such a novel extra thing you can unlock. It felt like a celebration for your insane achievement of getting every emblem. There's also Heroes Controversial Super Hard Mode. 
I say controversial because the world having one last hard version of every team Sonic stage is insanely cool, but I can easily see how after all the hard work you did with 4 versions of the game that are all basically the same but not really, in a game that feels that would explode at any second doing your air rank, the game just being like, do it again but harder bitch, can be a little annoying for some. But hey, at least there's no air ranks to get anymore. But I think Sonic Frontiers does this the best. The base game already did a great job at making one of the cyberspace missions to get an S rank, so getting them always felt useful, which is not something the other games can say. But then they have just made getting S ranks even better. Update 1 added both the cyberspace challenge and the battle rush modes. If you beat all the cyberspace challenges with an S rank, you unlock the option to use the power boost in cyberspace. And if you S rank all the battle rush stages, you unlock extreme difficulty. A new difficulty option that sets all your stats to level 1 and makes it so everything kills you on one hit. Yes, even the titans. And if that wasn't enough, in update 2 if you beat all the action chain stages with an S rank, you unlock the almighty spin dash. And with it, you can actually. Let me just show you. Yeah! In my opinion, Sonic Frontiers lacks some of the great replay value the series is known for, but with all these new updates, that issue has become non existent. Thanks to these updates, Sonic Frontiers might just have the best movement in any Sonic game. And replaying cyberspace stages became a drug that the tiny little speedrunning part of my brain is in love with. But, with all that said and done, we need to keep talking about Sonic Frontier just a bit longer, cause this game is the perfect example of what I consider the single most important aspect of the ranking system. And for that, we need to flow into the light. One Dash 2 Sonic Frontier is one of the most infamous levels in the entire franchise, for having one of the hardest S ranks in any Sonic game despite being the second stage in the whole game, and I love it. Despite not having points, no trick system, no upgrades, One Dash 2 is one of my favorite stages ever, just because of that high difficulty, forcing you to be pixel perfect with your movement, take the smartest route and avoid any distractions. This is a stage that might annoy you on the first few tries, but once you master it, it becomes one of the greatest feelings a Sonic game can give you, and coupled with the smart decision of making S ranks important with the bolt keys, you have a level that successfully gaslights you into replaying the stage over and over again, making you appreciate the game on a deeper level. And isn't that the whole point of the ranking system? 1-2 is proof that no matter how it's implemented, if a ranking system makes you want to keep going, then it succeeds at its job, and the high difficulty of this one level is that final piece of the puzzle that completes the ranking system. So why is every other level so easy? This is something I already talked about in my own Sonic Frontier review, but it's still so baffling to me how they did it, but in just one level, I never looked back. And in retrospect, it opened my eye as to why I don't like the ranking system for any other game that isn't Adventure 2 or Leash and Colors. It's the difficulty, it's all there. Everything attacked before still very much applies, and we always defend a balance of time and points, but none of that matters if the difficulty is not properly turned. Generations, forces, and frontiers have brained their ECS ranks that take away a ton of the fun of replaying stages from those games, and then you have stuff like Hero, Shadow, and All 6, which has a similar high level skill to something like Adventure 2, but it's Heroes, Shadow, and All 6. AKA, the three less polished games in the entire series? So if a light speed dash fails or you die by some random BS right at the end of the stage, say bye bye to that precious A or S rank. And while I haven't talked about the non Sonic stages in this game, this also applies to stages like Eggman Land or Mad Space. And I think that's why, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how great your ranking system is. Without good game design and a satisfying difficulty that's not too easy but not too hard, it won't matter. And I know that because Sonic Frontier's first update added one more tiny change to cyberspace. If you play it on extreme mode, every single S rank is just as hard, if not harder, than 1 2s. And this, 
This not only changed how I play Sonic Frontiers, but also how I see every ranking system with a different perspective. So when the next game comes around, I hope Sega finally learn what makes a good ranking system. And if that happens, I will be the first in line to replay those levels over and over again. But that's what I think. What do you think of the different ranking system in Sonic? Do you like them? Do you care about them? Which one did it the best? Did it the worst? You can tell me all that and more in the comments down below. And while you're down there, why not hit that subscribe button and like the video to get more videos like this one. But that's all from me, you get an extra for finishing this video, and I'll see you on the next drive.